Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Taylor Parker? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Taylor Renee Parker was born on December 8, 1992, and lived in New Boston, Texas. This is about a half hour west of Texarkana. She had a daughter sometime around 2010 and married a man named Tommy sometime around 2011. Taylor and Tommy had a son in 2013. In January of 2014, Taylor underwent a sterilization procedure, and in August of 2015, she had a hysterectomy. Taylor's marriage did not work out. Tommy accused her of being unfaithful. Their divorce was finalized in March of 2018. Taylor gave up custody of her son to Tommy. Eventually, she would owe over $8,000 in back child support and penalties. 11 days after getting divorced, Taylor married a man named Hunter Parker. That relationship failed as well. They divorced in July of 2019. Before this divorce was finalized, but after Taylor separated from Hunter, she went to a rodeo and met a roofing company supervisor named Wade Griffin. The couple became romantically involved, but Wade would later say that he was not in love with Taylor at any point during the relationship. Perhaps sensing this love deficit, Taylor made a bold move. She fabricated a story about how she was an heiress who was going to purchase a $4.5 million walnut farm. Motivated by the siren song of the walnut farm, Wade decided to stay in the relationship. But of course, the real estate deal never went through. In late 2019, Taylor tried out a different strategy to keep the relationship together. She falsely claimed that she was pregnant. This was not Taylor's first fake pregnancy. She had done this at least four times before when she was with various romantic partners. On one occasion, when questioned by someone who wondered about how she could be pregnant after having a hysterectomy, Taylor responded, quote, It's a miracle. All my stuff grew back, unquote. For the fake pregnancy with Wade, Taylor claimed that she would be having a daughter named Clancy Gale. Taylor put in a lot of effort to make this fake pregnancy convincing. For example, she created fake ultrasounds, posted on social media about being pregnant, told people that she was excited, claimed that she had morning sickness, and even purchased a fake belly. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On October 9, 2020, at 9.37 a.m., Taylor Parker was pulled over by the police in DeKalb, Texas, about 15 minutes from New Boston. She was holding an infant in her lap. An umbilical cord was connected to the infant as if Taylor had just given birth. Taylor and the infant were transported to McCurtain Memorial Hospital about an hour north in Idabel, Oklahoma. The infant was pronounced dead a few hours later. Back in Texas, the authorities received a 911 call at 10.18 a.m. from the mother of a 21-year-old woman named Reagan Michelle Simmons Hancock. The mother had visited Reagan's residence on Austin Street in New Boston and discovered that she was dead. When the police arrived, they found a gruesome scene. Reagan had been brutally attacked. She had been stabbed more than 100 times. The police noticed that there was one very large wound across her abdomen. They discovered that Reagan had been 34 weeks pregnant, but there was no sign of a baby. They realized that somebody had murdered Reagan and taken her unborn child. It didn't take long for the police to connect the dots. It was obvious that Taylor was the perpetrator of this horrible crime. Hospital staff determined that Taylor did not give birth to the infant who was in her vehicle when she was pulled over by the police. Investigators in Oklahoma interviewed her. Taylor admitted to attacking Reagan and taking the infant. On October 3, 2022, Taylor Parker was convicted of murder and kidnapping. On November 9, 2022, she was sentenced to death. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Taylor Parker had an extensive history of deception and manipulation. 
In addition to the multiple fake pregnancies, she had fabricated many intricate stories, many of which were designed with the preservation of romantic relationships in mind. Taylor also faked medical problems and visited multiple physicians to get the diagnosis that she was looking for. She tried to convince people that she had a stroke, multiple sclerosis, and other serious illnesses. Even though she was never prosecuted for it, the state alleged that Taylor had committed welfare fraud from December of 2010 to October of 2020. She misrepresented several items, including pregnancy status, marital status, how many people lived in her household, and her income. Item number two, while Taylor was in jail awaiting trial, she participated in many activities which attracted the attention of the authorities. A few examples, she misrepresented her medical history, like she demanded an oxygen tank in her cell. Taylor would tear up her jail clothing in order to be more sexually provocative. She had multiple relationships with female inmates, although she became tired of this and wanted to connect with men on the outside. She specifically expressed an interest in acquiring a sugar daddy. Taylor claimed that she was getting a movie deal from Netflix. Her family owned ranches and had millions of dollars in oil and gas money. And she was working with an attorney to control false information that was being disseminated about her. She said, quote, I want my innocent side to come out. I am wrongly accused, unquote. In a moment of generosity, Taylor offered her services to the FBI to help them solve murders. I suppose this is not completely unreasonable. After all, Taylor did solve two homicides, the ones that she committed. Item number three, from jail, Taylor engaged in what the state would later call a twisted and extremely complicated plot. The state said that Taylor approached a mentally fragile inmate named Hannah and asked her to fabricate a witness statement. Hannah was supposed to write a statement claiming that she was at the scene of the murder and saw a black man driving a black car. The idea here is that Hannah saw the real killer, which means Taylor must be innocent. I don't think this plot was particularly complicated, but it did reveal something about Taylor's state of mind and her abilities as a criminal. Taylor does not appear to have any understanding of how people perceive her. She believed that she could manipulate people with this comically simplistic alternate theory of the crime. Further evidence of a lack of empathy can be seen in how Taylor misjudged Hannah. She thought that Hannah would be a conspirator, but instead Hannah told the authorities about the plot. Taylor also generated many other stories about what happened when Reagan was killed. In one version, Taylor claimed that Reagan was actually the perpetrator of the stabbing and wanted Taylor to take her daughter. In another story, Taylor was kidnapped by a gang of criminals who brought her to Reagan's home. The criminals then forced Taylor to carry out the crime. Taylor employs the idea of an alternate universe with such frequency she could write for Marvel Studios. To be fair, I doubt that anything she wrote could perform worse than the film The Marvels. Item number four, Taylor may not have been effective at manipulating the state, but her efforts to deceive her former boyfriend, Wade, were quite successful. During the trial, Wade testified about how he believed that Taylor was telling the truth when they were together. During the Walnut Farm deception, Taylor created this large and complex cast of characters in order to trick Wade. Some of the characters were certainly creative. For example, there were bank executives, oil company executives, a Mexican mafia hit squad, a law enforcement officer known as Coburn, and a lawyer named Blake Lawington. Taylor put the word law in the last name of an attorney, yet she didn't call the police officer Coburn Coppington. I guess she didn't want to be too obvious. The characters all had distinct background information, and whenever Wade would try to call any of them, it would go to voicemail. Later, he would receive a text message containing an excuse. Wade explained how Taylor had an explanation for every odd occurrence. Often, she would produce paperwork to back up her claims. Despite Wade's tale of being deceived by Taylor, the defense implied that somebody would have to be pretty gullible to believe what Taylor was saying. I think what happened here is that Taylor understood that one of the keys to this type of deception is fabricating a fantasy that a person needs to believe is true. In this case, the fantasy was to grow walnuts. Maybe 
Wade wanted a wondrous and whimsical walnut farm and wrestled with wishes he would not dare wash away. Item number five. Unfortunately, Taylor's elaborate deceptions escalated to homicide. Her crime was premeditated. Prior to the murders, she searched extensively to find locations where pregnant women would be. For example, hospitals, clinics, and certain stores. Taylor traveled to those locations. This included going to places not only in Texas, but to locations in Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. She looked for information about how to convincingly fake a pregnancy and how to register a home birth. On the day of the killing, she watched a video of an infant being delivered at 35 weeks. Reagan was 34 weeks pregnant when Taylor murdered her. The two women did not know each other very well. Taylor took photographs when Reagan became engaged and for her wedding, but that was about the extent of their relationship. It appears as though Taylor targeted her simply due to the fact that Reagan happened to be pregnant. There was no prior animosity between them. Item number six, several mental health clinicians assessed Taylor as part of the criminal proceedings. One clinician said that Taylor had features of all four cluster B personality disorders. Another clinician claimed that compulsive liars do not tend to commit violence and predicted that Taylor would not be violent again. This clinician may have been forgetting about the murder part. Being a compulsive liar may not predict violence, but having killed two people certainly does. Not surprisingly, there was also a clinician who said that Taylor had no mental disorders. This seems to happen in many of the high-profile murder trials. Now moving to my final item, number seven. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Taylor appeared to be a pathological liar. This behavior is associated with all four cluster B personality disorders, antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic. Features from all these traits could be seen in Taylor's behavior, and they all played a part in her crime. Taylor was not effective at keeping a romantic partner, but she was good at initially attracting one. Her sexually provocative and attention-seeking behavior gave her an advantage in this area. This connects to histrionic. Once in a relationship, Taylor became terribly frightened about being abandoned. Her fear of rejection was constant. This is consistent with borderline. Taylor was self-centered, grandiose, had a sense of entitlement, and believed that she was special. She was narcissistic. Taylor's borderline fears of losing romantic relationships were processed through her narcissistic grandiosity, which led her to develop elaborate and lofty fabrications, like the walnut farm fantasy and the fake pregnancies. She did not believe that anyone was intelligent enough to figure out that she was lying. Ultimately, when histrionic, borderline, and narcissistic traits failed to get Taylor what she wanted, she resorted to her last trait, antisocial. Taylor conducted a brutal and sadistic attack. She had no remorse. She had no empathy. Taylor did not care about her victims. They were simply objects to her. Killing human beings meant nothing to Taylor. The only thing that mattered to her was her own desire. Now moving to my final thoughts. Taylor's personality pathology grew out of control in the context of a romance, yet spilled over and harmed innocent people who had nothing to do with that relationship. If Taylor was willing to commit this crime, there is no limit to what she could have done. There is no limit to what she could do in the future. This case demonstrates how desires can filter through the cluster B personality traits and come out distorted, destructive, and deadly. Those are my thoughts in the case of Taylor Parker. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.